Come. I'm gonna re- I'm gonna respond to a hangout now. A hangout that took place between Vegan Gaines and Bering. Uh, 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 vegan Gaines subbed by Jack Green and Bering subbed by Kraut and Tea, which is a vegan dish, by the way. It, I, it, incidentally, this live stream is a perfect example of why I don't often debate people live. I, I, why I don't respond to calls of let's discuss this in a stream because live streams don't have a good track record for solving disputes more often than not they just go round and round in circles and get more confusing and end up causing more disputes than they solve in in this case neither side wanted to have the arguments on the other side's terms which is understandable it just held things up a lot but do, well, well I'm, I'm gonna have the argument on your terms big and gains in terms of ethical justification, I'm just not going to have that argument with you in real time. <laughs> because I think you have a screw loose. So I, I will attempt to make sense of this situation in a slow, redrafted, methodical way, if you'll indulge me. Frankly, this is still less annoying than the footage of Women's Day that I'm supposed to be covering for the reasoning. <laughs> Alright, let's get on with it. Okay, I, I, can, I can agree that humans are superior to animals in virtually every metric. Interesting. Possibly a little bit infantilizing, but we'll come back to that. We're smarter, we have civilization, we have moral agency. Why does that grant us uh, moral justification to needlessly cause their suffering and death? He keeps framing this argument as though eating meat is tantamount to causing death and suffering to animals. I understand he doesn't mean it's directly causal. He means we're responsible for it because of the supply and demand. We choose to make ourselves part of the demand, therefore we're accountable for the supply, which I do accept. But here's the thing. Well, the point I'm trying to make is you keep bringing up things like smoking cigarettes, cocaine, you know, scotch, shit like that. These sorts of vices, they only harm you, and it's and it is a personal choice that you can make, but it only harms you. If by your logic the act of eating meat makes you indirectly responsible for the meat industry and all the battery farms and slaughterhouses that go along with it, then the act of taking cocaine makes you indirectly responsible for the cocaine industry. If eating meat equates to needlessly murdering animals, then taking cocaine equates to needlessly murdering Colombians. And if you think the the cocaine industry has no effect on ecosystems, think again. You need space to grow it. It's not... A lot of people think cocaine is some, some kind of powdered alloy that's made in a lab. Isn't it? Is it from a plant? Just like weed, just like heroin, just like aspirin. Now, my answer to this conundrum is end the drug war. End prohibition, it has never worked. Decriminalize all recreational drugs and the black market will dissolve into a white market. That was a drug reference, not a racial one. The solution to the meat problem is, 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 is more complicated. It's not illegal. So it's entirely in the hands of supply and demand. And therein, I think, there is a case to be made for eating less meat. For not eating obscene amounts of it, anyway. And for making some effort to find ethically sourced meat, if you can afford to. I don't approve of battery farms, and I don't think it's too controversial of me to say that, ideally, there sh- should not be a single battery farm anywhere. But it's just that, an ideal. Getting there is going to involve a lot of pragmatism along the way. And I'm not sure if prohibition is a solution, because the thing I just said, prohibition never works. I didn't, I didn't hear anyone advocating for prohibition of meat. But if that's not your argument, then all you've got left is, please don't eat meat. And as you were informed in many, many iterations, that argument's not going to fly. My primary advice would be 7 billion humans is too many. Please stop exploding. I realize some of us have to reproduce in order to keep species going, but, but if, you're, if you're one of the devoted folks who's never going to reproduce, then you have already done your bit. <laughs> you are already an environmentalist of the most effective kind by far. If you never have children you might as well have single-handedly planted a rainforest. You you, you breeders out there who insist on spawning more humans, you're going to have to think of something else. 
you're going to have to go level five vegan with a negative carbon footprint before you can say shit to me. We, yeah, we can go up to 10 billion humans if you like, or we can go back down to a billion. Which do you think will make it easier for us to ethically source our farmed goods? To me, the ideal situation is not one in which all animal farming is abandoned, just one in which the suffering of the animals is minimized as much as possible. I, I see nothing wrong with raising an animal in an open environment where it can frolic around with other animals and have a life expectancy longer than it would have in the wild. You know how most animals die in the wild? Either from an untreated disease early in life or from being skinned alive and eaten by a predator early in life. An organically farmed, naturally fed animal will have their diseases treated and their predators kept at bay. They will suffer less and live longer than the average animal in the wild, especially when you factor in the infant mortalities. So how can you say, I'm causing it suffering and death by eating it after it's dead? The farmer caused its death by killing it, but the farmer is the very person who gave it a, a safe, long, happy, predator-free, disease-free life. The farmer prevented the animal from suffering at the hands of the wolves and infections that would have killed it in the wild. I'm against unnecessary killing. And how can you say its killing is unnecessary? To what extent is death necessary? That, that's not a rhetorical question. Death is necessary so that life grows in generations and ecosystems can adapt to change over time. Without death, all life on Earth would be a, a single colony of some kind of fungal mitochondria that regenerates itself. And then a meteor hits the Earth, and bang, all life is over, because it can't adapt. So it is necessary for these animals to die, just like it's necessary for all organisms to die. And if we've already granted them the privilege of living longer than they would in the wild, then it is necessary to kill them for the sake of the ecosystem. It's a problem we caused. Unfortunately, we caused it thousands of years ago and we can't go back now. These animals are mutated beyond recognition. We can't just undo the generations of selective breeding and return them to the wild. We're stuck with it now. We are responsible for their lives and we are responsible for their deaths. Any change we make to this system is going to have to be gradual and it's going to depend, bottom line, on the size of the human population. Everything else is a drop in the ocean. Just say. I'm against unnecessary killing, even if it's done humanely, which I think humane killing is just an oxymoron. Then you are an oxymoron. <laughs> or a deliberately ignorant virtue signaler. If you can differentiate between necessary killing and unnecessary killing, then you can differentiate between humane killing and inhumane killing. It's, for instance, when it's necessary. What are you going to do if you accidentally run over a, a raccoon with your bike? If, if it, it ran out in front of you and you, you went over it with both wheels before you could react in time. You turn around and you, and you see it there. It's, it's twitching like crazy. His guts are all hanging out and shit. He's definitely going to die today. But it's not dead. It's just suffering horribly. What do you do? Vegan. Do you, do you just go, meh, and you go on your merry way and leave it there to die? That would be inhumane, in my opinion. Do you scrape its remains off the tarmac and carry it to the nearest hospital on your bike? <laughs> While it dies slowly and painfully in your arms? Yeah, that would still not be the most humane option either, in my opinion. You keep mentioning death and suffering, Mr. Gaines. These are two different things. When it is very clear that the last half hour of this creature's life will, will be nothing but searing pain and suffering, you do the humane thing and you kill it as quickly and painlessly as possible. It's a good thing you have that gun of yours. How about I just take my gun and put you out of your fucking misery? I have, I have no problem with gun owners, but I worry slightly when it comes to gun owners who can't for the life of them think of a humane way to kill something. 
by the way, all, all, all that stuff I said about ethical farming, it only really works for herbivores, predated ones in particular. Because herbivores tend to enjoy just hanging around in a field, in a large herd, preferably with no predators. Carnivores, not so much. Like cats and polar bears and eagles and sharks. Most carnivores are only happy if they can travel long distances by themselves in any direction. So keeping them locked up in a small space of any kind is against their nature and therefore unethical. Whether you intend to eat them or call them your friends. Yes, the same goes for certain roaming species of omnivore. But it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that we don't farm carnivores. <laughs> yeah, there are probably exceptions somewhere. You know, far off east, perhaps. But the vast majority of livestock, and there is a vast amount of it, is cows and chickens and sheep and pigs. Pigs are about as omniv omniv omnivorous as we're generally prepared to eat. And quite a lot of us aren't prepared to eat. So, yeah, there are three very good reasons we don't farm carnivores. One, it's unethical. Two, it's impossible. <laughs> this is why we call it herding cats. And three, it's unhealthy anyway to eat carnivore meat. Carnivore meat's not very nutritious for it. Unless you're a super carnivore that only eats carnivores. Like, like a polar bear, they eat seals and seals eat fish. But to reg regular omnivores like us, it's not good. It's very high in vitamin A. To a lethal degree in the case of the polar bear's liver. It's a factoid everyone knows by now. So yeah, um, farming carnivores would not just be unethical. It'd be a bloody stupid idea. But for most herbivores, indeed, even for a herd of herbivores, to live on an open farmland isn't against their nature. The only difference is they'd never encounter predators and they never run out of food. And there's none of those inedible, overgrown canopies of thistles and bracken, and just it's just acres and acres of grass and no wolves, which to a cow or a sheep might as well be a paradise of supernormal stimulus. It's, it's actually not entirely dissimilar to the trade-off that civilized humans make in nature, in the wild. Humans are lucky if we make it to 35. Here in civilization, we're expected to make it to 70. The, the, the social contract we have with each other is the price we pay for the privilege of doubling the life expectancy that, that nature gave us. And it's largely thanks to the better living through chemistry that we've discovered. This is why I don't just bugger off to live in the woods. Yeah, not just because I've not, got no idea what I'm doing. Even if I did, I would probably still choose this. Civilization. Where, where there's no bears and wolves and typhoid. I turn 35 next week. Every day I live from now on is a day I earned by living in a cooperative society. Yeah, you know, that's another difference between herbivores and carnivores, and indeed, uh, you know, omnivores to some degree. Carnivores are smarter than herbivores. Much smarter. They've evolved to be exceptionally sensitive in one department or another. Herbivores, for the most part, have evolved to be grass-eating machines that exist in huge herds that are simply too big to fail. It's, it's really remarkably easy to keep herbivores happy. Just give them grass and don't scare them. Keeping omnivores happy is different. Dare I say more nuanced. Uh, another thing vegan gains keep saying is that what our ancestors did is irrelevant. And <laughs> this is a logical fallacy. It's utter nonsense. Whatever our ancestors ate in order to evolve the brain we're currently using is self-evidently important if we are to maintain it. As, as we know, animal morphology does not form by coincidence. It forms by gradual adaptation, by subjection to a consistent environment, consistent stimulus, and a consistent diet. And this is what I mean by animal morphology. Look at these pictures. To which one of these birds should I feed meat? Yeah, you know the answer, but do you know how you know the answer? 
To which one of these mammals should I feed meat? Guys, you know the answer, and the answer is a lot more simple than you think. Hint, it's not the teeth. Now then, the next round is the trickiest. To which one of these primates should I feed meat? Y you may have still not noticed the difference, but your brain did. You got it yet? It's the eyes. It's where the eyes are on the head. Let's go through them again. This grain scavenger on the left, eyes far apart. This meat sniper on the right, eyes close together at the front. This slow herding herbivore on the left, 360 vision. This salmon harpooning, moose wrestling, eat anything that moves monster on the right, stereo vision. Now here's the tricky one. The story of the lemur is, is rather a fascinating one. They are primates, but for millions of years on the island of Madagascar, lemurs have been evolving separately from all the other primates. And where other primates have evolved into, you know, monkeys, baboons, chimps, gorillas, and humans, and whatnot, lemurs, in their isolation, have lacked competition. So they've speciated, but uh, stayed much the same in form as they were millions of years ago, which provides us with not exactly a living fossil, so to speak, but certainly some kind of evolutionary time capsule. Primates evolved from tree-dwelling, slightly squirrely-looking things like lemurs. So our eyes evolved from that to that. Why did they do that? Why did evolution gradually change our 360 vision to our stereo vision? Was it so we could spot the grass from a distance? Was it so we could hunt down the seeds and the nuts and the grains and grab them quickly before they scurry away? I put it to you that it was not. Now, an obvious monkey wrench you, your pardon the pun, that you could throw into, the, into my works at this point, which you're, a lot of you are probably already thinking of, is, but Mike, look at this dude. This dude is a vegan. Look at his eyes. Uh, they are, they're right up there. He makes Putin look like a baby blowfish. Yes. But here's the progression. This dude, a herbivore, evolved into this dude, an omnivore, who then evolved into this dude and this dude. It is perfectly possible for an animal to evolve from herbivore to omnivore and back again and have traits left over from the omnivorous period. On that time scale, it's bound to happen all over the place. We're talking tens of millions of years. Several ice ages, several mass extinction events, and an awful lot of migration. In the gorilla's case, uh, the, the stereo vision is something of a throwback. It's something their ancestors needed for hunting, but they don't need it anymore. Because they've just been chilling in the jungle for millions of years. Now they just use their eyes for facial communication. And not very effectively. But maybe maybe that's got a lot to do with why it's a very bad idea to look a gorilla directly in the eyes. They see it as a sign of aggression, and they'll fuck you up for it. Where humans and chimps will see direct eye contact as a sign of affection. I mean, it might be because stereo vision is still fundamentally important for humans and chimps, but mostly vestigial for gorillas. So don't look gorillas in the eyes. It reminds them of their long-distant meat-eating ancestors, and it triggers them. Don't poke it in the vestige. Don't poke anything in the vestige. So, for humans, the fact that we have eyes close together and facing forward is proof, or at least very strong evidence, that at the very least, we are evolved from animals that hunted meat for millions of years. There's no benefit to evolving stereo vision if you're not trying to catch something. And there's no reason to assume our stereo vision is vestigial like it is with the gorilla, in, in my harebrained theory anyway. There is reason to assume it is not vestigial. Rather, it is still an active component of our survival mechanism. And that reason is how good meat tastes. If you give meat to a gorilla, they won't eat it. 
You, you, can, you can garnish it in all their favorite leaves and shoots and shit, but they'll eat the green shit and throw away the meat. But if you take a hot barbecue, throw a bunch of steaks on it and let them smoke for a while, 95% of the humans within smelling distance will start drooling uncontrollably. The other 5% are vegetarians. Some of the people listening to me are already drooling just because I described it now. <laughs> the very thought of barbecued meat just makes us go, oh. That's, that's an organic hormonal reaction. It's not just a tradition that we culturally adopted one day. It's, it's soft-wired. It's like smiling. Every human culture smiles when they're happy. Blind people smile when they're happy. Even if, even if they've never seen a smile and they don't know what one is. They just do it and they don't know why. It's biologically soft-wired. And there's no way it's an accident that barbecued meat smells so fucking good. And tastes so fucking good. That's not tradition. That's visceral. Literally visceral. <laughs> just like when we say, look how beautiful that person's ass is. That's nature's way of saying, for the love of God, fuck that. When we, when we say, taste how beautiful this meat is, that's nature's way of saying, for the love of God, eat that. Yeah, I, yeah, needless to say, if you can restrain from fucking everything that looks good, you can restrain from eating everything that tastes good. Moderation is important. Nobody can argue against that. But telling people they're ethically wrong for eating any meat at all it's like telling people they're ethically wrong for masturbating. Firstly, they're not. You're only spilling a seed that would never have germinated anyway. You're only killing an animal to whom you've already granted a full life. And would have died anyway. And secondly, it feels indescribably pleasurable to reap what you sow. So you're arguing against logic, and in this case, the logic has all the animal instinct on its side. You will never get through to people this way. And even if you do, you'll only mess with their heads. It's like you're trying to wrestle a dead rabbit from the jaws of a starving vegan dog. She is a vegan dog. She's eating all vegan food, so... So... So yeah, moral of the story is... Please don't feed a vegan diet to a dog. You will kill it. I, kill, killing an animal to eat its meat, not necessarily unethical. Killing an animal just for the sake of killing it, very unethical. Killing an animal through negligence for the sake of flexing your dogmatically politicized vegan ideology, highly unethical indeed. I, when religiously dogmatic parents refuse life-saving medical treatment for their child in favor of praying to Jesus for a miracle, they are guilty of negligent homicide, as far as I'm concerned. And exactly the same goes. But ignorant dickheads who kill their dogs with vegetables. Fucking hell. I thought this was something that only happened in satirical cartoons, but it's real. People are forcing dogs to be vegans. This, this whole thing is a complicated issue, folks. But anyone who can slowly starve an animal to death in flagrant ignorance of all the world's unanimous medical information, and then have the chutzpah to lecture anyone about cruelty to animals. It's... No. Fuck that. In every hole. Every preferable hole. Boo this man! And now. Tell me why it's okay for people to own dogs without a prescription. Sure, dogs can be helpful as guide dogs and as therapy animals and as sheep dogs, but those are all specialist situations for which a licensed practitioner is required. If you let any Tom, Dick and Harry own a dog, then this is what happens. Not only will you get rich it girls demanding the supply of handbag-sized rodent dogs and you know, antisocial murderers demanding the supply of cage-fighting Rambo dogs, You'll also get befuddled crazies like Megan Gaines conducting their sick vegan experiments on hybrid wolf dogs. So basically, to put all this in perspective, if we're not allowed to have guns without a professional need for them, then we're not allowed to have drugs without a professional or medical need for them, then why are we allowed to have dogs? 
without a professional or medical need for them. Because in this case, we're not just hurting each other. We're hurting the dogs. Yes, I know. They have sophisticated cognitive abilities and an advanced theory of mind. That's why we should stop hurting them. But, you know, cue the crowds of hysterical alpha monkeys screeching, You just hate dogs! <laughs> yeah, and I just hate women, right? I don't like the way we infantilize women, and I don't like the way we torture dogs. So I obviously hate women and dogs. If you're wondering what that aching feeling is in your rectum, that's your principles. Reach on in there. Pull them out. Rinse them off and start again. Goodbye. Fuck you, Duffy. Fuck you, you...